koto tanaka koto tanaka to katoa uh ko chesapeake te awa cha ko musalak te maunga ko troy bays and toko ingoa um what i want to talk to you today is a bit of my background where i've just noted that i come from the chesapeake bay region world's largest estuary and i did my honors degree at dartmouth which happens to have a mountain called uh, Musilak, which is on the sides of which the term acid rain was coined. And these represent the reasons why I got into science. I spent much of my time in New Zealand working on climate change. And although I keep trying to develop pointy headed tools to actually solve these problems, I actually come quite frequently to realize, and much of my education prepared me quite well, I think, compared to what we do in, in New Zealand, for the notion that we have to look quite carefully at the engagement um, it goes beyond science. In fact, just discussing the economics talk this morning, we really need to not just have economics over here and science over here with a gap in the middle where we throw some words back and forth, but we really need to connect the two. Um, and we need to connect it with everybody who's in this room in order to be successful. So that's really what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about what do we do locally and what should Minister Parker be thinking about if he wants and we want to actually achieve reliable success with freshwater reforms. Obviously, it requires science, and everybody so far at the symposium has emphasized that access to science has been one of the most critical factors um, in what's been achieved so far. Uh, and I think that Professor Hamilton, uh, and also even uh, the people that came before him in these roles, deserve a lot of credit for what we have now to work with. Um, but again, it requires more than science. I'll just jump quickly into what I think are the ingredients for success that I've observed here and have been confirmed by what we've already talked about yesterday and today. It requires knowledge, engagement, strategy, and action. I very much welcome um, additions to these lists and what I'll do now is go through each of them. But then I'm gonna focus on are these, the things on these lists actually changing when we look in the rear view mirror versus when we try to go forward into the future. And I think the answer is yes, they are. So this first thing, the knowledge, it starts with history. One of the real success stories of Rotorua was that there was enough history of environmental monitoring to be able to construct the quality of the water in the lake back to the 1960s with confidence. And that, I, I think, prevented quite a lot of debate and contention that could have, could have gone on nearly forever. It allowed people to move on. And ultimately, it allowed science to project forward what you see here, which is the plan for reductions over time. And the other thing you can see in there is there was a period of reductions in the 1990s from wastewater treatment um, that achieved something, but ultimately was made up for again by um, agriculture intensif agricultural intensification within the catchment. A couple of th things we also know from this is that there was actually some fabulous economics work done in this catchment by Moltu to try to develop what catchment cap and trade might actually look like. Um, in much the same way there was some work in, in the tote ball catchment. Rotorua tends to be a lot more realistic and comparable to what we face in the rest of the country. And one thing Susie Kerr said was when I asked her about this some years ago to give a talk internationally was that what she found in this catchment was what they expected when they started designing carbon trading when she was working on her PhD at Harvard. So that's quite an interesting reality that you know what you can do is people that can gather in a room like this and think about how to make something work is quite important and it's what was imagined there. What we've actually accomplished with ETS is perhaps a bit less. That gets directly into the next point that it really is the ability of people to engage with one another and it's the desire of the community to achieve something that has to drive success. There's also an important level of discourse, experts coming in, but people in the community actually interacting with them and understanding, counselors, officials, and people representing the way forward within organizations like the Lakes Water Quality Society. Obviously then we need consensus, and quite often that really represents political consensus, then we come down to the things that actually are also quite hard and, and, and probably still contentious. And one of those, of course, is achieving equity. And that's an issue for allocation and that remains an issue under treaty settlements and EWI rights and interest issues. 
ultimately all these matters come down to trust. Trusting each other to go forward. Trusting the farmer across the fence, trusting people across the cashman, and trusting people with completely different identities. It partly depends whether you can look them in the eye. What I'll focus on a little bit more is how we actually develop an extended peer community. So there's a concept called post-normal science, which I'll focus on a bit more. And that's where we get the intersection of issues like climate change and water quality, where our catchments or the number of people involved are so big and the uncertainty is so large and the stakes so high that they work a little bit differently than the way we've traditionally tried to do science. It also comes down to strategy. And I think this is one point where I, I will say and acknowledge Minister Parker's comments that um, as, as we stand now, there's the potential to include things like attributes and indicators, and then there's the possibility of having something that resembles much more closely an accounting framework. And we're fortunate in Rotorua to have had a real accounting fr framework. Some, some of the characteristics of that um, are that it actually not only is a framework, but it actually is assembled into a strategy around that framework. It's well scoped. Ultimately, it enables us to be agile and flexible when we think about the, the uh, adaptive management and the cycles of five-year scientific assessment that are embedded in that process. It enables us to be risk aware so that uncertainties are well considered. So again, I've got Rotorua on the left here and the framework there. And then we have a figure that represents climate change on the right. And what you see with Rotorua is that we know where we're trying to go and where we're trying to get to. Now climate change, we're having a lot more trouble. We're dealing with this internationally, but it's actually a very similar problem. When you think about the Paris framework of climate change, it very much does, divides the problem up between countries to deal with quite differently as we might delve into dividing the water quality problems in our nation up between regional councils and catchment or freshwater management units to deal with differently. The reality of climate change is that we're struggling with that problem as a diverse set of people on the planet, but there's a very clear framework. And I think that's the question I would ask, is can you imagine if we'd actually focused internationally on climate health in the same way that we focus on ecological health as the core framework that we're working with? And I think that the answer is we would be having a lot of trouble if we didn't have the notion that you can have an accounting framework for greenhouse gases that gets us to one and a half degrees versus two degrees. And I think that's wherever possible something we need more focus on in fresh water and where a framework is actually the thing that can join together our attributes so that we don't think there's too many of them. We know how to focus on exactly the right ones, but have a consistent set of measurements and methodologies for all of them. Action, that's where it really comes down, right? And that's what has happened in Rotorua. Um, I think the key ingredients of action is that it's coupled to everything I just talked about. Knowledge, engagement, strategy, and frameworks. And especially with regard to knowledge and engagement, it makes each of those a process rather than uh, just something that stands alone as a noun, right? Strategy and frameworks, you could argue either way, but the net effect of it is the other ingredient for action has been investment. No matter how we cut it, $250 million has been allocated and mostly spent. And, you know, it is a lot of money. And often the first time you do something is much more expensive than the last. A really important consideration there as well is that, yes, that's $250 million. It's a lot of money, but my, the numbers I have to hand are that the primary sector in the region around the lakes generates perhaps $200 million per year or something like that. And that the tourism economy is popping its way close to a billion dollars per year. So this is not a ridiculous investment when we consider that's over 20 years. It does mean, however, that we need to keep our eye on the ball and things do change over time. So implementation needs scoping, risk management, flexibility, and engagement, the things that are often considered the soft parts of project management, but are often the most important. Guy highlighted the other side of project management, which is actually setting time-bound deadlines or time-bound goals and trying to achieve them. I, I try not to refer to them as deadlines where we actually need to maintain some of these other goals because each trying to maintain those deadlines can actually lose people along the way and it can actually undermine the need for review um, and so forth. 
So that's where I think adaptive management comes in as something that should be considered more deeply and has been a very important part of Rotorua's leadership. And also the TOEFL process has a 10-year review cycle. Um, that process was <laughs> developed as part of a, a, you know, an environment program uh, in 1978, so it's, it's well established and it, it interacts well with what I'm about to discuss, which is so-called post-normal science. There's the issue, though, that the future is different from the past. Before I get on to that, let's focus on what we've, what's really been successful here. So let's think about the nitrogen and phosphorus accounting framework using ROTAN. I put up a picture of that. Let's think about bringing in MOLTU, or really them bringing themselves in, but the fact that you attracted them here as one of the best cases where they could investigate this using a national funding source. There's the development and negotiation of the integrated framework. That's something people not, might not see as such a success, but I think it really is because it does represent a success in working through allocation issues, which are quite a difficult problem. And using that framework I mentioned first um, to develop the pathway there. It's a notion that actually, if you're getting the right frameworks in place, you don't necessarily need to agree on allocation, but you can set up a framework for limit setting that you're pretty sure is also going to be compatible with allocation and with EWI rights and interest issues, and I think that's the critical feature. Um, and then, perhaps quite importantly for me, some of the unnecessary complications were discarded along the way, including the notion of groundwater age. Though it's quite an interesting feature of the systems here and may delay up the ultimate responses of the system, it, um, it's partly overestimated and partly just a complication where an order of magnitude of complexity for people to try to understand and worry about resulted in, according to Meltu, 6% more efficiency in the system of what resulted. So obviously not worth it for an order of magnitude of complexity, and a good decision was made there to abandon it. Ultimately, though, the biggest part of excess is com community desire and acceptance. So now moving into the challenges where the future is different than the past, one of the first things I think we need to realize is that the process of understanding the future we face isn't necessarily the one we expect. It can be encapsulated in one of the scientific models I think many people understand as we move from a model of growth to a model of success at carrying capacity. Ec ecologists represent this with perhaps different organisms. So here you have a fast growing organism, which isn't very, um, very charismatic. Um, and it's a so-called R strategy, and so you can see the concept of exponential growth, and those of you with any kind of a science background will understand that, and the K strategy. I think they tried to come up with an equally uncharismatic animal to put on the K strategy. One of the most interesting, but perhaps least useful, concepts in complexity <laughs> science in the last 20 years probably has been this fabulous book on panarchy. It explains so much, but it's very hard to use for anything. However, with that said, I think there is one really important part of it that encapsulates, we don't actually stick at the keg, at the carrying capacity. In the real world, we tend to go bouncing around once we get there, when we expect actually to be able to take in the view and enjoy it, we find that actually the world doesn't stabilize for us. And so here you see the same sort of concept of R and K on a few different axes, and you see the idea that we actually go through a period of, of release. It's what an economist um, might, might refer to um, as creative destruction. And I'm often told that creative destruction is something we do very poorly in New Zealand. It may explain the New Zealand paradox or why our economy lags a bit behind those of the, our um, economic peers that should, in a way that should succeed. And ultimately, we should be able to proceed from that of destruction into innovation and success during a phase of reorganization. And that's what I want to focus on here, is that I would argue that there's, a, there's at least a good case to be made that what we're trying to do with fresh water at the moment, even in Rotorua, but also nationally, is a period of, of trying to go through a cycle of innovation and into a cycle of reorganization. And we need to think hard about what's changed as we go there and what's different from the past. So there are a key places to focus and figure out where we are. So if we think about there being a, a reorganized understanding of economic drivers, we need to think about what are the new forms of growth. 
And in the Herald, I referred to this as the idea that we really are genuinely at a tipping point, and this is something the minister recognizes in the freshwater reform package. However, um, I think that what we lack in that package is a sense, and if I were to ask a question, this, this essentially would have been it. It, it is that there's a, there's a process of trying to understand the turning point, but not a process of trying to understand how we afford this in the future if we don't have that $250 million that has been spent in Rotorua. And I think the answer partly lies in this, and I think that's the opportunity to consider as we go forward with what the government's initial response to be, will be and, and what we do in each region. And the simple answer is that we perhaps are at a point where the profit only motive of, of corporations, if you've been reading The Economist, that's come under serious question. However, um, the main reason for that is that both investors and also particularly consumers are driven not to the lowest price anymore. In fact, they want something quite different. And so we can dismiss claims that the price of food will go up. That's one side of the tipping point that makes it very difficult for us to afford uh, the sorts of restoration that we would like to have. Instead, if we actually say governments, okay, fine, they're actually trying to cut rates and taxes because that's what we want in the democracy, we need to find investment somewhere else. And the reality is that it's out there. Investors actually do have cash. They struggle, however, to invest it, and that's what we need to provide for them is certainty. Certainty to support that investment. And that investment can achieve value from consumers that will pay for health and environmental credentials, just as the minister mentioned, that when you go overseas, you'll see those credentials on every product in a good store. So the challenge we face anywhere where we think we've been successful is also the challenge of external disruption, that perhaps central, and fresh, central government, freshwater policy, or a whole bunch of other factors. It could be, could be the farming lobby nationally, could um, drive us towards less effective action and in fact disrupt our ability to actually maintain on target with our time-bound plans. Um, I'd also suggest that we need to work towards establishing a framework that perhaps closely resembles TLI, the trophic level index that everybody in this room will be familiar of with, because instead of a forest of attributes, it represents a very simple integrated index that has two drivers, nitrogen and phosphorus, and two measures of impact, chlorophyll A and Secchi depth, that represent what we want to see achieved and what we worry about, which is decreasing water quality and de increasing algal blooms. Um, so again, I'll come back to the point, imagine if we tried to deal with climate health as an international example, rather than actually having an accounting framework for greenhouse gases that can put in very simple terms what it means to have a 1.5 degree world or a two degree world. An interesting aside to this just came out yesterday and it's well worth some attention, although I think everybody here will have been uh, fabulously distracted with the symposium that we're having. Um, and that is um, a parliamentary commissioner for the environment's new report that looks at New Zealand's environmental reporting system. Now, one of the most important things about that is it actually calls into question serious deficiencies in the environmental reporting system we have. There are two that I'll really highlight here. The first is that it actually reports simply to report. It doesn't actually report in a way that leads back to action. I'll focus a bit more on that at the end of this. And the second is that it just harvests data. It doesn't actually um, invest in the data that we need to manage the environment. And the second thing is that it isn't necessarily, it's an indicator framework, it isn't necessarily an accounting framework. Um, I think that's fine. Um, so moving on from there, let's talk about post-normal science. Again, this is one of these comments that everybody gets potentially as scared by as wicked problems. Now, wicked problems, I, I don't advocate actually putting on a screen in New Zealand because people immediately think of problems that we're probably not going to solve with time-bound plans. Post-normal science, though, I think we've learned well over the last 20 or 30 years, and certainly the institutions I've been in have done a good job with it. The key idea of post-normal science, if you haven't heard of it, is the idea that normal science actually operates at a low level of stakes and a low level of uncertainty. And that, that once we move beyond that, we tend to bring in consultants. Well, the reality, as I said, of problems like 
uh, water quality at a large catchment scale, and for that matter, climate change, is that they have high stakes and high uncertainty. They also have a few other features. Often decisions are urgent or even late before you're making them. And even worse, values are in dispute when all this is occurring. So those are the challenges. The obvious role for science is simply to reduce uncertainty. So that's what the gray arrow in this diagram achieves. But what I really want to focus on today, and I put up this diagram many times before in the two years I've been here in, in Rotorua and around the university, to make this point of reducing uncertainty, and it hasn't entirely been taken up. People often wonder, well, why isn't he just getting on with the science? And that's this, a key point, which is that actually doing all this requires that transdisciplinarity, not having economists over here and scientists over here and people in the room over there. It requires everybody to come together into an extended peer community that is actually achieving discourse and discussion and then consensus about where we're going to go. And so that's what we need more of, and that's how we de generate transparency and trust about the information that we're using to make decisions and en end up avoiding being in a polarized post-truth environment that's dominated by short-term media news cycles, which is probably not where we want to be, right? I think everybody can agree on that. Um, the second side of all this that I, I'll now come to is dealing with the urgent need to recognize te, te al Maori. That's perhaps the most urgent example of values in dispute. And I come to it last, not because I've left it to last, but because I do think it is actually most important, partly represented by the lack of representation of Te Arawa Lake's trust in this room. Um, if we go through a list of what matters here, Te Mana O Te Wai, Mahinga Kai, and Mataranga are all processes which we think are important. Ultimately, it comes down to the people. So, and I think that one of the challenges of, of getting recognition and, and getting engagement in the room is not just having the invitation, but having it be truly compatible, having a number of speakers, perhaps having a pepe or actually sitting down and having a chat. But the other thing I'll say here that I think is, is really quite important is that the, the Te Tuapapa, Te Tuapapa Onawai o Te Arawa, so the cultural values framework, as most of you may know it, it's actually a pretty simple document. And if you're having an argument that you can't understand, it's actually a good thing to come back to. For me, it was actually very clear in the sense of, if I'm trying to work with Te Arawa Lakes Trust, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Um, there are a lot of things in all this that don't make sense, as with anything that has a lot of history embedded in it. And even to make sense of that, trying to understand these values is important. One of the things that, that Guy mentioned was that Maori, once they engage and are a significant presence in the freshwater debate, can be really valuable. And I think that's a really important point. And one of the reasons for that is as we, we go forward, there's a struggle there between leading land ownership, forest ownership, and environmental stewardship that they feel, and that's what this type of framework actually deals with. It sets in place a strategy that's driven by values for achieving that. So the challenge is to figure out how to keep everybody on board. Now, I'm ticking along with time here, and I want to get you off to lunch. So let's talk briefly about three areas of science focus for my uh, program and um, the areas I'll be working with the Regional Council on. Um, this is a way I've often put it up over the years. If you've seen me speak about it, this is breaking the trophic level down, index down into the different component parts, chlorophyll A, secchi depth, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. And so we can see that Rotorua is actually doing well, meeting its targets. We can also see that Rotoehu is not. And that's our challenge. We can also see which parts are actually driving the problem, and it's mainly that we're having algal blooms, and we can see a relatively large phosphorus signal there. We can also see what Guy mentioned in this, although now we're focusing on slightly different data than the council's producing, but what we see is, is an issue with phosphorus here, right? So if we come first to Rotorua, um, we won't be talking about this today, and this is an issue because I think one of the problems we do have is a lack of action. Um, the best way, to, of course, to produce a lack of action is something called environment court. Um, but that doesn't mean we should be sitting on our hands. And so the thing I'd like to emphasize about Rotorua is that we need to be thinking now about reductions to 2032. 
the clock is ticking. Farmers do not generally believe that they should be walking off the land and that the process of actually achieving this should entirely be land use change. I don't believe it either. I believe that it is possible to achieve a certain level of nutrient productions on the farm. We need to support people in doing that. We need to be able to verify what works and encourage more of that. However, the reality is that doesn't happen in two years. It tends, especially with nutrients, it's going to tend to take 10 plus years. In the meantime, we fought a little bit of time with something known as alum. And I just want to point out as an American that alum is actually something you can buy in the supermarket as a food additive. It's the reason why American pickles are crisp. So as well as a natural rather chemical that goes into things, it's not as um, hazardous as some people make it out to be, although I wouldn't go swallowing the whole like, jar in one go. <laughs> On the other hand, I wouldn't swallow this at all. This is a recent picture from the last year of Lake Rotoego. That's not what we want to see. And there's a number of factors in here. So this is something we'll be focusing on later on today. And Chris Eager, uh, in particular, will be giving a talk about a lot of the scientific details and a thesis that spanned the time David Hamilton was here to the time I was here, uh, arrived. And there's a few really interesting details. And of course, Andy will be talking about this as well. So there's a nature of trying to understand what's unique about this system why the alum addition stopped working, which may have to do with higher lake level for a couple different reasons. It may have to do with some unique aspects of the chemistry in Rotoego. It also may be that Andy's now able to address this with a consent that allows alum to be added elsewhere in the lake that gets us back out of this problem. The second big problem, as has been mentioned, is developing an accounting framework that supports our management of the Lake Tarawera complex, essentially the eight lakes that flow together here. I won't belabor this, you'll see this figure again that shows the flows between the different lakes and the relative trophic level indices. This will be Chris McBride's talk later on today. Um, the key thing there, the thing I do want to start pointing out, is that if we think about, for example, let's see, the laser does not work, but if you think about Lake Rotomahana, it actually takes a lot of the flow that comes into um, Lake Tarawera from agricultural areas, particularly the dairying areas, with higher levels of intensification. Every time you go through a lake, it has a high level of nutrient removal. A long residence time lake is probably on the order of 80 to 90 percent of the nutrients that go into it, settlement, sediment out within that lake. And so that's a relatively easy part of accounting for us to include. And we will. So well, two slides. Um, so the, the second to last slide, I just want to note again the, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environments Framework and come back to the really great thing about indicator frameworks, which is that they should actually feed back to making sure that what we're actually measuring and reporting on is getting responded to. However, what the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment pointed out was that the current system that's run nationally just runs straight across the green items here. It does not include the drivers of the problem, including the socioeconomic um, um, forces or, or how people make decisions, and it does not actually request that the government or other decision makers make responses. The key issue, I think, for everybody to think about if, as they're reading this report is that the way it's set up, it potentially leads to a situation where as we start to go around this loop and request that central government responds to it, it could potentially marginalize regional councils in both the monitoring and policy processes if that's not well considered in the development of the, the response to this report. On the upside, they've requested appropriate levels of funding for looking at all the issues around indicators. And so that goes beyond water quality, but it's certainly a good thing to highlight. And it goes into issues around biosecurity as perhaps deserving considerable new funding so that we get ahead of problems rather than trying to fix them after they've got out of control like welding pines. Okay, so then what are the things I would really like to leave you with as you head off to lunch with the idea of moving towards reliable success in our use of science? The first is let's make sure that we use the right framework. You know, so just to jump part back to the greenhouse gases example, even where it went wrong in the emissions trading system, we still know exactly where it went wrong and we have that full-on accounting framework and it feeds directly into indicator processes. 
we have that same kind of framework for Rotorua. Let's make sure we keep it and extend it into Tarawera. Ultimately, this comes down to the people and their decisions. We need to get them on board and keep them on board. We need to embrace diversity and, and um, do that because equity matters. We need to consider the so-called extended peer community that I discussed. And again, that includes not just different disciplines in science talking to each other, which is what's very much in that literature, but it also includes what's often not in that literature, which is the, the peer community that represents this room, where I think there's nobody who's more expert in driving progress forward here than the, than the people in the area themselves. We need to manage our risks. Obviously, we've had a considerable focus on pests. Climate change is another obvious risk that we need to leave headroom for, and one thing that continues to amuse me at times is that we don't actually plan for volcanic events in any way. Um, it seems like an obvious place to do that, I don't know. Um, ultimately, we come to, then down to also worrying about risks that represent external drivers. that could come from central government, could come from the politics and the divisions that are present nationally. Um, that, represent an understanding of uncertainty um, as we need it to understand risk as it affects decisions. You know, the, if we understand the risk that affects any particular decision, it may actually be a lot easier to incorporate that and actually target that within our models than to actually make sure that we understand the uncertainty within everything in our models. Ultimately also, I think that we need to understand the risk of um, not communicating well with each other. And that's perhaps one thing I should have added to this is that transparency and trust issue around communication. And to me, one way to represent that and, and one way that I've always mm -hmm. emphasized it is simply this. It's simply to break what we're trying to do, even if it involves very complex models, into something that can be represented in a spreadsheet or a table in a way that people can understand it, in the way that policy and planning can understand it. Um, and I think that's quite important. So ultimately, we need to also proceed in a systematic way using adaptive management cycles. And that also includes scientific assessment at each, at each turn around the cycle. And we need to embrace reorganization. I explained what I mean by that. And we can actually plan for that. We can accelerate it. But again, you know, the success of innovation processes does actually depend on the creative part of creative destruction. Finally, we need to understand the new economics of investment. Where does our next $250 million come from? Thank you.